All right, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, so one of the principles that we've had uh, in Cilium since kind of the beginning is uh, this idea that if, if we're to build the, the networking from scratch for Kubernetes, how are we going to do that to, to make it as efficient as possible? Uh, and BPF is really a key part of this because it allows us to extend that flexibility all the way down into the kernel so we can look at holistically at the entire sort of networking implementation and figure out uh, you know, how should we implement each networking piece to efficiently handle events that are happening within the system? Uh, so today we're going to talk about network policy, uh, and we're going to focus particularly on this idea of like scalable enforcement. So when I talk about scalability, I'm talking about like doing as little as possible each time something happens within the system. And so there are different ways you can kind of optimize this. So you can reduce the number of events in the system, and that, that's certainly one focus area uh, of, of the project. At the same time, you are still going to have a certain number of events. And so for each of those events that are happening in the system, uh, you need to be able to minimize the amount of work that, that you're doing uh, in order to implement an efficient data plan. And of course, in the context of network policy, uh, we need to actually enforce that policy so the, the user has a certain intent about who should be able to talk to who. Uh, and we need to carry out those instructions to, to have a secure uh, implementation. So when we look at a particular cluster, we have various different events that are happening in that cluster. Um, so there may be control plane events, um, so things like state distribution between the different nodes, between Kubernetes uh, API, API server uh, and, and individual nodes. Uh, and of course, this is scaling, you know, we're thinking about hundreds of clusters, you know, thousands of nodes, perhaps tens or, or hundreds of thousands of workloads. Um, and so minimizing the amount of work that we're doing uh, in order to handle the network policy implementation across that sort of scale. Uh, and then from an individual node perspective, you know, as you scale those workloads, uh, those workloads are talking to one another. And so uh, if we think about data plane events, we've got perhaps millions of packets per second that are running through the system. And so at that level of scale, like how are we minimizing the amount of work that we do to still scalably uh, enforce the policy? And so, as I mentioned, there are, there are different areas of focus that you can do to optimize how this is going to be uh, the most efficient uh, implementation that, that you can do. Um, today, we're, we're going to focus particularly on an individual node's perspective. Um, and so that's influenced partly by the control plane events that are happening in the system. Um, but then it's also, uh, you know, matters how the, the data plane events are, are being handled by Cilium. So we're going to focus on three areas uh, today. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about how we apply the policy efficiently. So we're talking about taking like a user-facing, high-level policy, human-readable, and converting that into a machine-friendly uh, implementation in BPF that, they can, that can then implement that policy. Secondly, we'll talk about how we're efficiently enforcing that policy. So as packets come into the system, what are we doing to be able to uh, enforce that network policy uh, at the data plane level? And finally, an important part of scale is how you have the tooling to be able to understand what happens when something goes wrong. So we'll talk a bit about, about the uh, debuggability tools that are available in the system. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Hemant, who can talk about applying policy efficiently. Uh, thanks, Joe. So if you want to enforce network policy with Cilium, our users currently have two major options. So you can either write network policy with Kubernetes network policies or Cilium network policies. So if you've ever written a Cilium network policy, some of this might look familiar to you. But primarily, the Cilium network policy has three major components. There's the subject workload that allows users to define which workloads this network policy should select. And then there's the target part, which allows users to specify in the selected workloads, which traffic related to that workload should this network policy be enforced on. And finally, the action part, which allows users to specify what should Cilium do with the traffic that was selected by this policy. So before we understand how this policy is actually implemented, we need to understand Cilium's identity-based security model. So what this really means is it allows users to express network policy in terms of who is allowed to talk to whom instead of having to worry about where a workload is deployed on or what IP addresses are associated with it. So in this example, I have three entities that are TIE Fighter, Dead Star, and X-Wing pods. And these are deployed in Kubernetes as pods. And 
In Kubernetes, every workload with a unique set of label gets its own security identity. And because it's a lot more efficient to store and compare numbers, every security identity gets its own integer, integer ID. So this is a really powerful concept because it allows us to represent a network policy. It allows us to have a, a network policy representation in the kernel that does not get impacted by pod churn. So your pods can come and go, but our identity allocated for each of these entity does not really change. So our goal for this section is to understand how the network policy that is defined by our users in terms of CRDs is converted into an identity-based allow list in the kernel, which will be used to enforce network policy. So, Every Celium agent that is running in the cluster registers a watcher with the Kubernetes control plane to get updates on Celium network policy or network policy objects. So every time a user creates a network policy object, these updates are sent to every single node in the cluster. It might sound a little counterintuitive to send or broadcast updates to every single node, but it's important that we have all the latest policy that is defined in the cluster already available on the node, so that when a pod is scheduled onto that node, we can enforce the time required to enforce that policy as as minimal as possible. So when the agent receives an update, whether it's from Celium network policy or Kubernetes network policy, the first thing that the agent does is convert that into a standardized internal representation and store that in the policy repository. So the implementation detail, um, so Celium actually implements both the policies in the same way. So if you take a look at a naive algorithm on how a policy computation algorithm might look like, for every policy that is known in the repository and for every endpoint that's running in the node, for each and every port protocol and direction combination, and for every security target you might want to allow traffic to, you need to have an entry in a BPF map. To illustrate how, um, how much volume this can generate, our users today might be writing thousands of clusters, uh, thousands of policies in a cluster. And every single node might have hundreds of pods running on them. And you might want to allow traffic to tens of thousands of security identities, depending on how many, how many workloads are running in this cluster or how many clusters are meshed together. So you can see here that uh, very easily you might have hundreds of thousands of uh, BPF map entry updates that need to happen on every policy iteration loop. So how can we do better here? Maybe we don't have to process every single policy update event. We can be smart about it. Or maybe we can cache and reuse all the intermediate computed state. And maybe we can employ some efficient data structures to do fast lookup and efficient computation. So let's look at a few common scenarios that the agent generally has to deal with. And we'll walk through what the agent does when, when it receives each of these updates. So the first update is policy create event. So let's imagine a scenario where you have a Kubernetes cluster which has no workloads on it, and a user creates a network policy. And I call this policy death star empire axis. What this is basically defining is we want to allow ingress traffic from any pod that belongs to our empire from, from pods that have the labels org empire and class death star. So basically, we want to allow traffic from dead start to any part that's running in org empire. So the first thing agent does is it basically takes the contents of the CNP and converts that into a standardized representation, as we discussed before, and it's stored in the policy repository. And every policy gets a revision number. We'll talk a little bit more about how this revision number is used. And the next part is we want to allow ingress traffic from pods that have the labels org empire, right? So if you want to convert this section into a BPF identity allow list, we need to convert these org empire labels into its corresponding identities, right? So every time we want to convert a set of labels into its own identities, it's a very expensive operation. So Cilium tries to cache every time it tries to convert org empire into its backing identities. 
So this data is stored in something called a selector cache. And at this point, we have no workloads running on this cluster. So it selects no identities. Now let's imagine there's a new pod called Death Star 1 that's scheduled onto this node. And this pod has labels org empire and class Death Star. And because our cluster has never seen these set of labels before, it has a security identity. It, it gets allocated a security identity called 1234. And uh, this identity gets stored in something called as an identity store. So now that we have a pod with an identity 1234 and it also has org empire, the selector cache entry is now updated to reflect 1234. So every, every CLM agent pod has a dedicated worker for every endpoint that's running, every endpoint or pod that's running on this node. So the responsibility of this worker is to basically make sure that the policy representation for that endpoint is up to date with the latest revision number that's present in the policy repository. So what this worker does here is it, it gets the latest uh, known policy and it compares the labels that are present on this pod with the labels that are expressed in the network policy and it comes up with the relevant set of rules for this specific endpoint. And again, this is also an expensive operation. So Cilium Agent tries to cache that in something called as policy cache. And what we can do here is we can cache that against the identity of the pod so that this allows us to reuse this computed policy the next time we have a pod that looks like this. And CLM agent also does something interesting here. So it goes back to the selector. So soon after the entry in the policy cache is added, it goes back to the selector cache and updates references to entries in policy cache for every entry that selects org empire. So finally, we have all the data we want and we can join the data between selector cache and policy cache to compute the final identity I love list and update to this endpoints PPF map. Now, what happens if you have another pod called Death Star 2, and this pod also has the same set of labels? So it inherits the identity 1, 2, 3, 4, and we already have all the data that is necessary to compute policy for this endpoint. So we simply join the data and update the contents into this endpoint's PPF map. Now, so far we've been talking about events that are happening on just one node, but what happens if there's a new pod that's created on a remote node? So let's say there's another node called node two, and this time there's a pod called TIE Fighter. And this has the labels org empire and class TIE Fighter. And because we have not seen these labels before, CLM allocates a new identity for this called 2345. And the node one instantly gets notified about this new security identity, and it gets updated in its own local identity store. And this is the state uh, in node one before it received an update about 2345, right? So now that we have another identity that selects org empire, this gets updated with 2345 as well. And remember, we spoke about um, how selector cache has mappings back to policy cache. So now from selector cache, we can quickly jump to entries in policy cache that are relevant here. And this allows us to very quickly compute only the new entries that need to be updated to the BPF map. So there could already be like thousands of entries in a BPF map, but all we need to compute is entries for identity 2345. So this allows us to have really fast incremental policy updates. Now, what happens if there's another part called TIE Fighter 2 on a remote node? We already know the labels for this part, so it inherits the identity 2345. And we don't have almost, we don't have anything to do on node one for this. All the policy that is necessary for 2345 is already in place. So from a policy computation perspective, there's absolutely no work that needs to be done. So to recap the section, um, what we learned here is that Cilium agent uses, uh, Cilium agent tries to cache all the expensive operations during policy computation. And we are being smart about when we regenerate the policy. We only generate the policy once, the first time we see a new identity. And we are also using efficient data structures to make sure we are able to quickly regenerate uh, policy, incremental policy. So now I'll let Joe talk about how this computed policy uh, is used in the data path to enforce the network policy.
All right, so, so taking it back to the high level, we're, we're kind of trying to say, how are we doing as little work as possible any time events occur in, in, in the system? And so as we're getting down to the kind of per packet level and, and how the kernel implements uh, the networking behavior, uh, I want to focus on two particular areas here. So one is in provisioning the BPF programs to actually run every time the packet event occurs. Uh, and secondly, I want to go through a bit about the different functions that are happening at the data path level um, and uh, talk about the optimizations we've put in place to make that efficient. So firstly, if we look at what's happening when a pod gets scheduled onto a node. Uh, so the kubelet gets the, the schedule request and, and reaches out to the container runtime to be able to create the sandbox for that pod, ready for the application to, uh, to run. And the container runtime calls out to the, the networking plugin to actually attach that uh, sandbox to the network. Uh, at that point, the CNI plugin, Cilium uh, here, you know, uh, informs the, the Cilium agent that it needs to load and attach the BPF programs to actually run on those uh, events in the system. So we're going to zoom in a little bit more on this last part of the diagram here. So what are we trying to achieve? Uh, so first, we're going to take uh, all the pod metadata that we have for this particular pod, so things like IP addresses, the security identity, and other configuration for that endpoint. Uh, and if we take all of that information together, we can actually tailor the individual BPF program for the particular endpoint or the particular pod. Uh, and so by doing things like embedding the security identity like directly into the uh, assembly instructions at BPF, we can make that incredibly uh, efficient. Um, and so once we've compiled that BPF program for the particular endpoint, uh, we can then load those BPF programs into the kernel uh, along with map state, which is more dynamic state that uh, the the kernel needs to be able to perform networking functions. Uh, and then we attach that program to the event, like a, a packet processing event. Finally, once we've implemented all of this, we can return from our CNI add call and uh, you know, the, the network is ready to actually handle traffic and container runtime can, can start your application. So one of the things we uh, you know, noticed when we actually started to measure this is that the uh, compile step here was, was taking a little too long or longer than we'd like it to, to take. Um, and so we put metrics in place to be able to measure the different phases, um, and we identified the, the, the compilation step is, is taking too long. Now, with this compilation step, what we were trying to achieve is for every single packet happening, uh, being handled in the system, we want to minimize the amount of work that we want to do uh, in order to handle that packet. But then we introduced this uh, trade-off here where the pod churn rate would then be increased. Um, so we kind of wanted a way to be able to actually achieve both of these things. Uh, and so the solution we came up with was what we call ELF, ELF templating. So the idea is that when you compile the, uh, the BPF programs in the, the very first time uh, on the system, uh, we store references to where the security identities and IP addresses and so on are within the BPF instructions uh, and template that. And so what happens when a second or later pod uh, gets deployed onto the node is that we can then take this ELF, we can uh, substitute the uh, individual BPF instructions, security identity, and so on. Um, and then we'll get all the efficiency per packet that we got before, but we've also drastically decreased the amount of time that it takes uh, for that pod initialization to, to occur. So with that in mind, what we've finally arrived at is what happens when an individual packet actually gets uh, sent through the system. And so in this case, we've got the, the TIE Fighter and, and it sends a packet It's trying to reach out to the Death Star. And so there are very diff various different uh, network functions that are necessary to implement policy. So I'm not going to go into a deep dive of all of the data path here, uh, but some of the key, key areas that, that, uh, that are important. Um, so first thing, uh, if the traffic is destined to like the Death Star service, then we need to load balance that traffic to an individual backend, because uh, then with the backend, we can determine the security policy for that particular traffic. Uh, secondly, um, we go into what we call the connection tracking table. So at a high level, when you're defining a network policy, uh, you tend to express it in terms of something like TIE Fighter can talk to Death Star. So this is inherently connection oriented. You're talking about one particular uh, application talking to another. But at the packet level, you actually have two-way communication. You have reply packets sending back to the uh, original TIE Fighter. Uh, and so when we want to implement the policy to say TIE Fighter can talk to Death Star, we actually need to allow the replies back as well. Uh, so what this connection ta tracking table uh, does is it allows us to associate the reply packets back to the original connection, uh, and then we can just express the policy purely in terms of the original direction traffic. Uh, 
So now we move on to uh, determining the identity of the, of the target traffic. And so there are various different ways we can do this. We can pull this information out of uh, headers from a tunnel uh, packet, uh, or we can distribute this state between nodes through, um, through the control plane. Uh, and so this will depend on whether you've got ingress, uh, we're applying this traffic on ingress or egress or tunneling mode and various different things like that. And finally, with now that we know everything about this traffic, we know where, who it's, uh, who's talking to who, uh, we can then look up this policy map, uh, and this is all the stuff that uh, Hemant had described earlier, um, and we can efficiently figure out, should we drop the traffic, should we allow the traffic, should we redirect it? Uh, and after that, we can apply things like authentication and route the traffic to where it's going to. So I want to look uh, into uh, a few optimizations we've put in place at individual steps through this process. Uh, so first up, uh, if uh, anyone, any of you are around for uh, Martinez's talk in, in San Diego, uh, he did a deep dive into how uh, Cilium's coup proxy replacement uh, works. Um, and so one of the core ideas here is actually to move the load balancing decision up to the socket layer uh, so that when it comes to per packet processing, we actually have nothing to do anymore. Um, so it's, there's nothing quicker to do than absolutely nothing. Um, so from a per packet, you know, uh, you know speed um, kind of perspective, that, that's, uh, that's really fast. Uh, secondly, uh, so we use what we call a, a LRU-based uh, hash table for the connection tracker. So what's interesting about the connection tracker is, as a kind of part of a networking system is that it's really tracking all of the active connections that are running through the system at this time. And so depending on the scale of your system, that table can end up being very, very large. Uh, and so one of the problems we have is like, how, how do we efficiently keep that table uh, accurately tracking the, the active connections that are going right now? Uh, and that involves things like cleanup. And you do spend some CPU uh, cycles on, on trying to clean up this table. And so by using a hash table with the least recently used property, uh, when a new connection uh, arrives, we can actually automatically bump out old connections from that table. Uh, and then the garbage collection process is much faster. And finally, if we look at the, uh, the policy uh, level, um, you know, we want to try to ensure that when we enforce policy, it has a constant time uh, you know, uh, performance uh, characteristic. And so if you have thousands and thousands of policies at the Kubernetes layer, we don't want to map that down into the data path so that every time you know, millions of packets are flowing through the, the system per second, we don't want to be running through thousands of rules to be able to determine should we allow the traffic or not. And so all the work that um, Himantha talked about is about amortizing that cost and, and, and building up this map so that when we identify who can talk to who, um, we can prepare all of the information we need to make that decision in the data path uh, so that it can, it can happen in constant time. So to, to wrap up the section, uh, so we talked about embedding pod metadata, things like security identity, like directly into the instructions um, about how we measured and amortized the costs of pod churn. Um, and then how we can, like different strategies we've used at the data path level to optimize the performance, whether it's you know, triggering on events with a lower frequency um, or mitigating the CPU usage for maintaining tables or um, you know, avoiding linear iteration at the actual per packet level uh, so that we're doing as little work um, at the packet level as, as possible. Uh, so with all that in place, um, Hemant's gonna walk through debugging the, the policy. So every once in a while, you might want to validate if Cilium is enforcing the network policy, the intended network policy correctly. Or you might have users reaching out to you, asking you why they're unable to talk to their destination service, or why they're seeing timeouts to this specific IP address, or tens of other variants of the same question. So luckily, Cilium from the get-go has invested in some tooling to inspect and debug every stage of this policy computation process. So in this section, I'll walk through some of the tooling that already exists today and how we can look at some of the sections we talked about in the earlier sections. So the first step is if you want to inspect all the policy that a given Cilium agent knows about, we can exec into the Cilium agent process and there's a binary called Cilium debug and we can use this command called Cilium debug policy get. This dumps all the known policies on this specific Cilium agent process. And we spoke about selector cache. If you want to inspect the in-memory selector cache, we can use Cilium debug policy, select, Cilium debug policy selectors get 
to look at every selector and the identities that it maps to. And you can see the identities one, two, three, four, and two, three, four, five we spoke about earlier. And we don't have a direct way to look at the policy cache, but you can do Cilium debug endpoint list to get the list of all the endpoints that are running on the node. And once you have the endpoint ID, you can get the full contents of this specific endpoint. And one interesting property here is that you can see that uh, the derived from rule section has a policy called death star empire access. So if you're curious on what policy is being selected on this given endpoint, you can always verify it from here. And finally, if you want to look at the computed BPF based allow list, you can do Cilium debug BPF policy get. This, uh, tell, this is a direct rep representation of the uh, data that's written to the per endpoint BPF map. And what you see here is the target identities are already converted into the backing labels. But if you want to look at the raw contents, you can always use BPF tool map dump to get the exact content, uh, to, to get the raw content. And Cilium Debug has a lot more subcommands like this. Um, one more important one could be Cilium Debug Endpoint Log, which gives you all the recent uh, logs that have happened in the context of one specific endpoint. And there are also a lot of metrics that are available. You can monitor Cilium BPF map pressure. Uh, Martinez had a demo about this earlier. And you can have metrics on policy enforcement status to understand how many endpoints are currently in enforced mode. And you can also monitor uh, your policy enforcement delay. So I'd highly recommend uh, check out docs.cilium.io to look at all the command reference that we have. Uh, and if you haven't used this already, uh, there's a quick shout out to this tool called Hubble Observe. This is more user facing, so you can look at which identities are talking to what destination identities. And if you are a developer, and if you want to get more details on why exactly you have a drop, you can get references to the exact line number on the BPF code to understand where the drop is coming from. All right, so uh, hopefully you've got a bit of the picture about how we make scalable policy enforcement by doing as little as we can uh, whenever events occur in the, in the system. Um, so we talked about how to apply the policy efficiently, how to enforce that policy efficiently, and how to debug that system efficiently. Um, so if you're interested to discuss more with us, uh, come and have a chat with us. We have a booth, uh, uh, and uh, Himant actually has another talk on scalability uh, later this week. Uh, and of course, we'll be uh, happy to receive your feedback uh, on this talk. So thank you.